Uh, today's scripture comes from Genesis 1:26, and then I'll be going to John 17, 1a, and then 13 through 19. Uh, so Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Uh, John 17, 1a. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, I'm coming uh, to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and uh, the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you would uh, take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is truth. Lord, I pray that as we look at your word today regarding what it means to be created uh, for holiness, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us insight um, into the joyful life that you have designed for us, and Lord, that you would give us courage to embrace your word and live in light of its truth. I pray, Lord, that your gospel would be clear to your people despite my own inadequacies as the messenger. And that your people would be built up in every way into Christ, their Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, in one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya, the Spanish swordmaster, out for revenge, he comments to his terrible boss, Vincini, responding to Vincini's overuse of the word inconceivable. I'm not going to speak it as Vincini does. I'm also not going to use Inigo Montoya's accent. But what Inigo Montoya says to him after he says this word is, is he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. This has become one of the most quoted lines from a very, very quotable movie. I should know I quote it often. But I also think that statement particularly has become quotable because it's so applicable um, to us. We often use words without really knowing what they mean, like the word random. That's a pet peeve for many people and say, that was so random. No, it wasn't. There's a, there's a logical, explainable series of events. Is there anything really random that happens? Um, I do not think that word means what you think it means. But holiness, when we come to the word holiness, I think this phrase is applicable. Oftentimes for us, that word does not mean what we think it means. It's an idea we struggle to define and may even define incorrectly. You know, in this series on what it means to be made, to be created, um, in, made by God in his own image, we've talked about our purpose, how we were made with a purpose, how we were made with inherent worth, how we were made with good limits, and now we're looking at what it means to be made for holiness. And what I want you to see as we look at this word and then look at this passage from John later in the sermon is that as God's people, we are remade holy in Christ for relationship with God in the midst of the world. That we um, who've trusted in Christ are remade holy in him for relationship with God in the midst of the world. As with all the sermons in the series, we'll follow the biblical storyline uh, that defines our own experience of creation, God's good creation. How sin corrupts God's good creation of us and how Christ redeems and restores God's good design. We're created in holiness 
Sin corrupts our holiness, but through faith in Jesus, we are made holy for him and his mission. In the account of God's creation of all things in Genesis 1, humanity is set apart from the rest of creation. Alone, humanity is declared to be made in God's own image and to be made very good. This is at the root of what it means for us to be holy, to be set apart by God for him and for his purposes. That's the definition I want you to go with, is that to be holy is to be set apart by God for him and for his purposes. Holiness has an object, God, and it has a purpose, a mission, his purposes. And that's actually, again, what the word holy means. Often when we hear the word holy, we think of moral purity in isolation. We think of someone who doesn't do anything wrong, who perhaps looks down on evil, separates completely from any sin or sinners, implicitly judging you by their effusive righteousness. I don't know if you've run into a holier-than-thou person. It's an epithet. It's a negative statement. Um, Oftentimes, culturally, we use the word holy to mean something negative about a person, that they're judgmental. But moral purity is actually secondary to the meaning of the word holy. It's not its primary meaning. The word holy in Greek, hagios, it literally means set apart, dedicated, or consecrated. In John, the word sanctify is used three times right at the end of the passage Greg read for us. And all sanctify is, it's the verb form of the word holy. It means to make holy or to consecrate. Set apart, dedicate. You know, growing up, we had a special dinner plate in the Samuel household. It was the red plate, and that's what we called it. It was just the red plate. Perhaps some of you had a red plate in your homes. I think it was, um, like, marketed on TV or something at one point. But anyway, um, it was kept in its original box, and it was stored in our corner cabinet in, in the dining area, Um, that was reserved for where the the special silverware was stored. Um, It was always clean. It came out of that box for each member of the family only once per year on their birthday. And it said in big, bold, white letters, you are special today. It was an immense privilege as a child to eat from the red plate. And I'd remind my mom in advance to get it out every year because I didn't want to miss the time I ate on the red plate. That plate was holy, right? It was set apart. It was dedicated or consecrated for a specific, valuable purpose. It was respected and honored and kept clean and free from damage. You know, you and I were made just like that plate. Holy. Set apart by God for relationship with him and to represent him and his rule in the world. That's what Genesis 1, 26 says. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He created them to exercise dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing. That's what he made us to do, to be representatives of his rule in the world. But I want you to see that holy is an identity before it's a behavior. It's an identity before it's a behavior It's something which involves moral purity, but isn't actually that moral purity. If you need another reason to believe me that that holiness is not defined by moral purity, look at the last verse of our passage from John. It says for them, uh, Jesus says, for them I sanctify myself. Can Jesus make himself more holy than he already is? Can he make himself more morally pure than he already is? No, he's perfect. What does he mean when he says, sanctify myself? I set myself apart as a sacrifice for them. It's talking about his purpose, his mission. It's talking about what he was to do. He can't make himself more morally pure. You know, the Westminster Children's Catechism, there's a a briefer version of our catechism that um, has been published to make it really easy for young kids to understand Um, But it captures this created design well. It asks the question, in what condition did God make Adam and Eve? 
The answer is, he made them happy and he made them holy. Happy and holy. You know what's so interesting, though, is that we often in our culture see holiness as the opposite of happiness, don't we? We think the call to be holy is all about limits on my enjoyment. It's all about refraining from doing the things that the world finds fun. We think that pursuing holiness is the opposite of pursuing happiness, but that isn't the case at all when we understand holiness rightly. We were created to find our deepest satisfaction and happiness in living relationship with God, walking with him in the garden as Adam and Eve did, and conformity to his design for our purpose. Holiness has an object, God, and a mission representing him. Holiness and human flourishing are actually one and the same thing. Holiness is living consistently with our design. That's actually where moral purity comes in. The life God designed us for and set us apart for was morally excellent and pure because he is morally excellent and pure, and we were made in his image. The Westminster Confession of Faith calls this moral purity original righteousness that we were designed with, that we were designed without sin. We were designed to represent God in our righteousness, human moral excellence before sin entered the picture. But we need to see that people aren't holy because they were morally excellent. They were morally excellent because they were made holy, because they were set apart by God for himself. Holy is an identity before it is a behavior. What I want you to see is that if God designed us for holiness to be set apart for him and his purpose in the world, it is absolutely crazy to think that true happiness and flourishing could be found in rejecting that good design. But you know, that's exactly what sin does. When you look at modern society and the world around us, to, be, um, to, to understand what it thinks it is to be holy, what it means to be set apart in the world, it's not about being set apart for God and his purposes, but being set apart for myself and my purposes. Authenticity is the holiness of today. Be true to yourself. You do you. That is the message, the creed that defines modern holiness. It is an intense individualism that denies our created design as being determinative for understanding our purpose and what leads to the flourishing life, the good life as God designed. Autonomy, self-rule, each person sanctified to themselves. We see this all over the place. We see what this produces. Confusion about identity. Confusion about reality. Choosing our own facts and reality. It results in chaos, conflicts, greed, and the sanctification of greed. For my desires are what are holy. And it results in antagonism in our relationship with God and fellow humans. As the rejection of God's design of us in holiness, sin produces conflict and chaos. It undermines our holiness by denying that we were set apart by God for him. That we were made in his image to represent him in the world. But the good news is that Jesus decided to intervene in our sin. He came to make us holy again. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose for our life, he died and rose to make us holy. Or through faith in him to be again set apart by God. Everyone who trusts in him is made holy by being set apart for him. That's what this meal celebrates that we're going to celebrate later. When we take and eat of Christ's body and blood shed for us, the bread and the wine, which or grape juice, which represent him to us, we are again recognizing that we have been set apart by his shed blood to live for him. You know, we I I love baptisms, and we baptize babies in this church. Um, And what baptism is, is it's a marking or a sealing, a setting apart of that child as God's possession, that they were made by God and that they are his through Christ. Now, we don't dedicate babies. The only example of dedicating babies is in Samuel. Um, It's it's, um, 
It's when uh, Samuel is left at the temple um, by Hannah, his mother. Um, Love your kids. Don't do that. Uh, We baptize your kids here. (laughs) Uh, We do not want you to leave your kids here permanently like Samuel was left. (laughs) That joke must not have come across the first time. Thanks for the laugh. (laughs) Makes me feel good. Um, But Jesus came to set us apart again. Turning to our passage in John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer We hear Jesus praying that God would sanctify his disciples. That he would set them apart for relationship with him and for his mission. And there are two elements in this passage to that sanctification. And I'm focusing on the last three verses here. The first is about moral purity or conduct. He prays, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In other words, set them apart By your word, by your commands, by your design for them. Let them represent you in righteousness. This is a prayer that God would conform us to his word, make us like Christ. This is about moral excellence and obedience to God's commands. It's a prayer that God would um, let us be his images in the world, representing his character and the way of true human flourishing by their love for him. And their love for one another. For it is in these two commands that Jesus sums up all of the the commands of Scripture. These commands, they aren't oppressive. They aren't limiting. They're actually designed for our freedom and our joy. God is committed to this work, though, of making us more like Christ. Of setting us apart by the truth and pattern of his word. It's what Colossians 3, 10 through 11 calls us to. Put off the old self with its evil practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of, his, uh, of its creator. You see, there's, an, there's a sense in which we are sanctified. We are set apart if you've trusted in Christ. That is definitive. It is unchanging. Yet also we are being sanctified. We are being renewed as we live out what it means to be set apart by God in holiness. We're like that plate, kept clean and protected, reserved for the use that God has designed it for. And we are to pursue character that resembles our Savior. But there's a second part to our holiness, and it's the one we often ignore when we think about this word. It's about mission. It's about purpose. We're not merely set apart for God. We're set apart for his purposes. In John 17, 18, immediately after Jesus asks that the Father would sanctify us by the truth, he says, I'm sending them out. I'm sending them out into the world. What that means is that our holiness, it has a context It has a place that its implications are worked out in, and it's not in these walls. It's out there. It's in the world. It's in your workplaces. It's in your neighborhoods. It's in your families. It's in the places that are so dark and so desperately in need of light. Your holiness has a context and a mission, and it is to take you outside of these walls into your lives. That as you are going, you might be his images in the world. You know, throughout the millennia, Christian holiness has taken many forms. We can look at this and trace this throughout history. There are those who have thought the call to holiness um, was a call to domination. Some have sought, like Rome, by the use of military and political power to make the world holy through dominance and power. But if the Christianization of Rome teaches us anything, it's that Christian governments corrupt as quickly as non-Christian ones. We can't make the world holy by force. There will be no truly lasting Christian nation until Jesus comes again. And it will cover the world. Others have resolved the contrast between being holy and being in in an unholy world by retreating from it. By seeing our being set apart as a call to separate from a sinful world. 
You can think of monastic life, monasteries, and, and the hermit monk who, who's holed away in an abbey. Um, but you can think of it in more practical senses, in, in examples we see today. More practically, we can think of the Christian who sees the call to holiness as a command to separate utterly from sinners. When we as a church decide to embrace the holy huddle mentality, we huddle up here in our holiness and then we go out scared into the world and then we come back here into our holiness and we talk about the things of God and then we go out and we just try to live quietly in the world. You know, Sarah Groves long ago wrote a parody song about this idea that it's just really compelling. Um, It's called, We're Taking Our Church to the Moon. (laughs) It goes, we're taking our church to the moon. We're taking our church to the moon. There will be no people there to tell us we're odd or try to change our opinions of God. Just lots of rocks in this dusty sod. We're taking our church to the moon. It's the holy huddle mentality. But what did Jesus say? Right after he asked the Father to sanctify them by the truth, he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. To be holy is to be set apart by God for him and his mission in the world, that we might represent him in the world. In other words, you cannot be holy in isolation. It is not possible to be holy by yourself in a corner. Your holiness has a context, and it shines brightest when it is out in an unholy world. You see, our purpose hasn't changed from the beginning. And we can't actually be holy or embrace the holiness for which we were made without being in the world. You know, I think of the story of the rich young ruler when he comes to Jesus. And Jesus talks with him, and this rich young ruler, a wonderful man, he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus talks about the commands, and and the rich young ruler says, well, these I have kept since I was a youth. But then he says, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then come follow me. And what happened to the rich young ruler? He went away sad because he had many possessions. He thought holiness was done in isolation. That holiness was merely about moral purity. Not about context. Not about purpose. Not about mission. And he got it wrong. And he went away sad. Pursuing holiness is not about domination. It's not living in some alternate Christian society. It's not about never being around sin or separating from a sinful world. Nor is it about being absorbed into an unholy culture and not looking any different. All of those things are easier ways around what we have actually been called to be and to do as Christians, brothers and sisters. A sanctified presence A sanctified, holy, loving presence in the midst of an unholy world. That's a whole lot harder than any of those other things I mentioned. That in our love might be seen the way of true happiness, hope, and wholeness in Christ. Living in the tension of being in the world, yet constantly contrasting with it. And if we are to embrace that call... It will require churches and individual Christians to take seriously God's word. To long for what Jesus prays that the disciples would experience at God's hand. That they would be sanctified in the truth. We need to know and love God's truth. That while we are in the world, we would not be subsumed into its way of living, but would be able to live in contrast Glorifying God while surrounded by an unholy culture. It will also require us to take seriously Christian discipleship. Whether it's of ourselves, of our children, or of one another in loving Christian community. Brothers and sisters, it is not easy to live as a Christian in this world. And your children, they see it and they know it. They know how much what we see here on a Sunday contrasts with what they see in their friends, in their schools, in the world. We need to be serious about preparing them, about giving them God's truth and sanctifying them in the truth. We need to be serious about that for ourselves as well, for the riches of God's 
plan for us are here. They're at your fingertips. Lay hold of them and learn to live in a way that pleases him. Learn to be a light and a witness in a world that so desperately needs it. We need to take discipleship and spiritual growth seriously. That we might stand firm. And that we might have children who stand firm. Not tossed around by the world. But also not afraid of it. It's not easy to be holy in the world. It's far easier to separate, to conform, or try to dominate. It's far harder to be like Christ. Who dives into the mix with sinners. And ultimately dies to secure their salvation. And rises to give them life. It is what he did for us. The closing line of our passage, Jesus said that it is for our sanctification. That we might be again set apart for him and his purposes. That Jesus himself was set apart as a sacrifice for us. He died on the cross that we who were unholy and without hope in the world might through faith in him be made holy set apart for him, and to be conformed to him. It's a work Jesus died to accomplish, and, God's, and God commits himself to do it in us. Brothers and sisters, my prayer for each of us and for us as a church is that God would make us holy and that the world would see it and long for the truth and the life we have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that though we were sinful, you came and dove into the midst of it in Christ. You went to the cross to forgive us of our sin and to set us apart for you. Help us to see our greatest joy and happiness in being holy and being conformed to you and set apart for your purpose. Give us a vision for your call to us to be about that work in this world. And give us the wisdom and courage to know what that looks like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear this benediction from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord.